Ladies and gentlemen, we are back with another edition of Dark Power. Welcome to an action-packed week. We have the semifinals of the women's tag team tournament, the Deadly Draw, on AEW. We have a very jam-packed episode of AEW Dark. And last, last but not least, we have the first week of Impact Emergence. So we're going to get started with all of that, guys. But before we do, remember to hit that like button, that subscribe button. Comment your thoughts, your concerns, what you think is going on with Dark, with Impact, everything and anything that's happening on Tuesdays. We love to hear the comments. We love to see that interaction. Share it with your friends. We appreciate anybody who is always reaching out and helping us to reach more of the wrestling community and to bring new people into the wrestling community and that's one of the things that AEW is trying to do with this women's tag team tournament now we've talked recently over the past couple weeks about some of the drawbacks of the deadly draw um, and it's kind of a situation where we don't really need to talk about those things but those issues are going to kind of show themselves throughout the course of the two matches tonight now the two matches are Nightmare Sisters versus Big and Little Swole, and Ivelisse and Diamante versus Tenere Conti or Tay Conti and Anna J of the Dark Order, who hasn't officially joined the Dark Order, but kind of comes out with them, and maybe as part of the Dark Order, we're not sure, but there's something going on there, right? So we're starting off strong with the Nightmare Sisters match, and they... Pick up the win. It's kind of evident now as we progressed. I had this feeling when the tournament was first announced and we first saw who might be in it that this was more of a vehicle for Brandy and and Allie than anybody else. And that's kind of holding true. They are picking up wins over the competition. And it's a situation where, again, if there were... Not better. I don't want to use the word better. We'll say more seasoned. More seasoned competitors... Well, and, and that's something we've talked about, and we don't need to get into it again. And the way I, reason why I said it rears its its, its head or, or, it, or it makes its presence known is there are, in this match, four women, three of which are signed to AEW and one of which isn't. If you're wondering who's going to take the pin, it's going to be the one who isn't. Nicole Savoy is the one who, Nicole Savoy, Little Swole, is the one who takes the pin so that the Nightmare Sisters can advance we're seeing more and more of that heelish kind of aspect of Brandy coming out. She's more concerned when, at one point in the match, uh, she she so she's now coming out with. We'll start with that. She's now coming out with her two action, or two of her action figures, Little Brand Brand, and she gives the action figures to QT Marshall. Now, when QT Marshall takes a uh, suicide dive later in the match, she's more concerned about whether or not anything happened to little Brand Brand and the action figures than she is to QT Marshall. Also throughout the match, you're going to see Allie picking up the slack of when Brandy is kind of showboating a little bit too much, and that's an interesting reversal. I will say that at least. It's an interesting reversal of the dynamic before, whereas Allie was kind of the heelish one and Brandy was the face-ish one. Now they're having Allie be the face ish one and brand even more of the heel ish one so it's an interesting kind of role reversal in that sense but overall it's just kind of lackluster because of the overall lacklusterness of the tournament itself the second match to me was the stronger of the two matches this is Ivelisse and Diamante versus Tay Conti and Anna J. again we have four people in this match three of whom have heavy ties to AEW or are signed by AEW, and one of which who recently made their debut in the tournament. And if you're wondering who's going to take the pin, it's that fourth person, and it's Tay Conti. Tay Conti takes the pin so that Ivelisse and Diamante can continue onwards. Like I said, to me, it was by far the better of the two matches. Case in point is that later, when they're cutting promos regarding the finals of the match, Ivelisse and Diamante do reference the fact that between the two of them, they have 26 years of experience in the wrestling ring. That's incredibly powerful. And they know each other, and they know each other well. They're kind of well-versed in anything. Sometimes you can see in matches, and you can see it in dark in the AEW Dark matches sometimes, when things aren't known of what should be happening next, sometimes there are performers who aren't able to get that creative burst or creative spur of the moment to know, hey, let's just do this. 
and there's that couple like maybe one or two seconds of hesitation and it doesn't always show but when it does show it's glaring and I will say that Ivelisse and Diamante they are two that don't have that so when they are in the ring it adds that level of seasoned veteranness to the affairs to the proceedings and as we move onwards to AEW Dark we see veterans and people who have that seasoning continue to shine and those who don't or aren't necessarily as exposed on TV are getting some of that experience. We're starting off strong with Kip Sabian versus Michael Naka Naka Nakazawa. Uh, Sabian picks up the win. All of these matches tonight are going to be very quick except for two tag matches. I don't think any one of them goes above five minutes, if I remember right, with the exception of Hybrid 2 versus Initiative, which went about 10 minutes, and then the main event, which went also in about 10 minutes. So we're going to move quickly through these matches, because AEW also moved quickly through these matches, and I'm pretty sure we're all a little bit more excited for Impact Emergence than we are for an episode of AEW Dark, when the two are being compared, right? So let's let's go quickly through this. After Sabian and Nakazawa pick up, have their match and Sabian picks up the win, we have Sonny Kiss and Joey Danella picking up the win over Stone and Sean Dean. Next, we have Sean Spears picking up a nice win over Hobbs. This time, he does not use the metal slug. It's more just about the viciousness of Sean Spears and how it continues to uh, get more and more physical after the match, whether it involves the slug or not. Following this, there's a Ricky Starks promo. Ricky Starks is coming back. He's making a comeback after Darby Allen jumped on him with the skateboard of thumbtacks that knocked him out for a little while. And Starks is saying, Darby, you're starting a war that you're not going to be able to properly handle, and I'm coming for you. I'm, I, when I said I was going to do X, Y, Z, those were not empty promises. They were guarantees. And that's something that Starks is going to have to prove as he continues to go after Darby Allen. Well, I'm not sure what's going to be happening with Brian Cage, but what we see that Starks is, is going to be focusing on Darby, at least it, it appears. And that's one thing I do like, is that we're now getting more and more promos on Dark. We're building out promos for Dark and storylines on Dark. I think it would be great if they had this match, if Starks and, and Darby have a, have a singles match, if it's on Dark. That could be a great main event for Dark. Um, after this, we have TH2 picking up the win over P uh, Peter Avalon and Brandon Cutler, the initiative. This is a... Longer match, ten minute match, like like I said earlier, and it's one of the it's because it has the time. It's one of the better matches of the night. I will say again, it's weird. Last week they did not they lost to the nightmare to the nightmare uh, um, natural nightmares, but this week they're winning over the initiative. It just seems kind of weird, especially because last week they could have also picked up the win, and you're stacking wins as you build the team back up from their time off. Why, I don't know, It's maybe it's that ring rust kind of situation that we're saying Natural Nightmares are that much uh, better uh, experience-wise than the initiative, which, I mean, by far they are. So, even from an objective standpoint, even if you're not, you know, saying what, what is the subjectiveness of kayfabe any given night, somebody can, can win a match. But either way, they're picking up the win over the initiative after this. There is Abaddon versus Red Velvet. This is a very quick match. Abaddon, again, wonderful character, knows what she's doing in the ring when it comes to presentation. And this is somebody who is doing this when there's no crowd around. I know she had that match with Karushita on Dark some months ago when we were still having people uh, in the arenas, which, you know, seems like a lifetime ago, right? Uh, but once they do have people in the ring, it's going to, that creepiness level is going to kick up. I think the entrance will uh, improve or the, or the or the reactions from it will improve. Sometimes it, it's more more so I mean I I don't like like we covered when I was on uh, going raw with drunk guy JJ. I really don't watch WWE's product anymore, so I can't necessarily comment to that with a 100% informed opinion, but from what I've heard the faces get cheered, the heels get booed on WWE when it comes to the talent that is ringside acting as the crowd. That kind of happens here in AEW as well, but the drawback overall is that the people 
know kind of what's happening. They know what's going to happen with Abaddon and her character, and so they're not as creeped out about it as the, as somebody else would be who either isn't expecting it or just isn't thinking about it in that in that light. They're like, oh shit, it's Abaddon, and all of a sudden it comes out. Whereas with, with the actual wrestlers, they're like, it's Abaddon. We know it's Abaddon. It's, it's, she's, she was at catering. Like it's it's a little bit different, so uh, I think she's gonna have a great transcendence. I don't know if that's too that might be too big of a word. She'll have a great uh, jump. We'll say jump when they are able to have live crowds again. After this, we have the Dark Order, which is in this situation it's the Dark Order B team, Reynolds and Silver with Colt Cabana. Colt Cabana not being the B team, Colt Cabana, my guy. But um, they are up against D3, Fabu, and Ryzen. This is a very quick match. It's more about kind of some issues going back and forth between Colt and the Dark Order. Colt maybe a little bit while he while he has potentially joined the Dark Order, it is also a situation where he is still himself, and that's going to come through no matter what, and he hasn't fully drank the Kool-Aid, or maybe the Kool-Aid hasn't fully taken effect, we don't know. But he is having a little bit of back and forth with the other members of the Dark Order. After this is a really good match that I liked, Ricky Starks versus Lee Johnson. Ricky Starks is making his uh, return to Dark after that good promo, and after the thumbtack situation, and puts Lee Johnson away in short order. But what's important here is not even Ricky Starks, despite the fact that Ricky Starks is a relative big deal in AEW, it's that after Lee Johnson loses, Wardlow comes out and forces Lee Johnson to put back on his MJF campaign button. We've seen, excuse me, we've seen Lee be a part of the MJF promos and vignettes and segments, but now we're kind of seeing maybe he's being forced to do whatever it is MJF bids him to do as our candidate. Either way, I'm looking forward, this is the shirt from last year, I'm looking forward to All Out this year when we can finally have a champion that we're proud of. When, it, when, it, when, it's, when it's MJF holding the AEW World Heavyweight Championship, Big Platinum, as, as Cody weirdly calls it. <laughs> but yes, not my, hashtag not my champion, hashtag we deserve better, hashtag MJF 2020. For sure, I say that just to upset my girlfriend because she hates MJF. And she's also a huge John Moxley fan. But after this, we have PNP on the road to getting Big Platinum. Uh, Moxley had his eye taken out, and he also took out the eye of a member of PNP. If we don't recall, that did happen. Uh, that's why it's always weird when we're having uh, eye patch issues. Uh, maybe it was AEW who started the trend of the eye patch or the eye poke or the eye injury thing, bringing it back, uh, speaking of Daniel Cormier and the UFC 252, uh, but they have a match against Baron Black, who I think was making his AEW debut, I'm not 100% sure about that, I have to go back and check up on that one, and Tony Donati, who was not making his AEW debut, but was picking up another loss, as PNP pick up a good tag team win over the team that's kind of makeshift team, that's one thing that's kind of annoying about the AEW dark matches sometimes when they're tag teams, the teams just seem thrown together. I think maybe if they did backstage promo or something like that, just to kind of establish teams a little bit more, because even within dark, there seems to be kind of a pecking order into who gets what kind of match, like Sonny Kiss and Joey Janela, Sean Dean's getting matches with them. Maybe this is how Baron Black and Tony Donati slowly rise up, but at the same time, PNP in the AEW tag team pecking order is above... Sonny and Janela. So it's kind of a, it's a kind of a weird situation. Speaking of a weird situation, the next match is Lance Archer versus Jesse Sorensen and John Cruz. John Cruz does not originally come out with Jesse Sorensen. We're kind of confused what's going on here, but it turns out that the uh, Murderhawk monster is actually bringing John Cruz to the ring. He wants to make sure he gets there, even if that means dragging him, kicking him, screaming, and throwing him into the ring. Um, Lance picks up a. Quick win over these two guys. Not much to write home about here. After this, we have Billy. No last name. Versus Five, a uh, member of the Dark Order. Billy picks up the win. And after this, he gets attacked by other members of the Dark Order. And Austin Gunn, who does have a last name, despite the fact that he's Billy's son. And Billy doesn't have a last name. 
but Austin has a last name. And I hate WWE. And so they, um, they, uh, they, he helps his father out, getting attacked from the Dark Order. And moving onwards, we come to our main event. It is a really strong eight-man tag match. Uh, match of the night for me. Lucha Bros with Butcher and the Blade versus SCU and Private Party. Strong match. This is kind of what I hope we're able to build more into dark, especially as we you know, try to get dark to be like the real second show of AEW. I know the pandemic has completely thrown that out the window, at least for the time being, but if that is still the plan, I'm hoping that we get more stuff like the Ricky Starks promo earlier, the Starks match itself, but then also things like this with this eight-man tag match, where they're slowly building stories within stories. We're having situations where uh, Butcher and Blade are having problems with SCU. We're also having, it, because that was, the, that was our, our main event last week, we're having issues, situations where Lucha Bros continue to have problems with SCU. Let's not forget where the Christopher Daniels may have lost a step thing came from. There's also Private Party being into the mix. We don't know exactly what's going on with Private Party and Matt Hardy. We're also seeing issues within Lucha Bros and Butcher and Blade. Even though they tagged together, once they once they picked up the win in this main event, Lucha Bros and Butcher and Blade couldn't really share a ring together too well. So there's, you know, building layers. I like that. You see layers upon layers of storyline. There's nuance to the storyline. This was a highlight for me. The TH2 Brandon Avalon uh, and... Brandon and Avalon match was also a highlight just because they gave these guys time. TH2 got plenty of time to be able to do the things that they do well. Ricky Starks got shine when it came to the promo and when it came to the match. It's kind of the halfway point-ish of the AEW Dark, kind of where you would put a uh, end of the first hour main event, so to speak, like that kind of hook to get people to continue to watch for the second hour. Uh, so I think it's, it's, it's building blocks. We continue to see what... AEW can do with Dark and where the ceiling is, and the ceiling is very high. They're continuing to grow, and we want to see how they how they continue to show out. Speaking of showing out, speaking of, of building and building blocks, Impact is doing that with Emergence this week and next week, and showing how they are going to build upon Slammiversary as we go towards Bound for Glory. Now, I thought this was a pretty good card. I... The Wrestle House stuff is starting to wear on me. It's just, it's... I understand that a lot of times wrestlers take acting classes, but a lot of them should take more acting classes. <laughs> I guess that's the easiest way for me to put it. We start off Impact Emergence in a firecracker of a match. This is match of the night. It's funny because I thought uh, Moose and Trey Miguel was going to be uh, ma match of the night last week, and I came into this thinking... That's probably going to be the match of the night. Then I saw this opening match for the X Division Championship. Rohit Raju picking up a surprise win over Chris Bay and TJP. Chris Bay no longer our X Division Champion. Rohit Raju is now our X Division Champion. I feel like I brought this 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 karma to uh, to Rohit Raju. Uh, I was there live when my guy Jinder Mahal won the WWE Championship here in Chicago at Backlash. Amazing moment. Everybody in the arena hated it except for me. I absolutely loved it and thought it was the greatest thing I'd ever seen in my life. Uh, okay, not the greatest thing. But, like, it's, it was up there. It was up there. It was, like, top 20 for us. Yeah. But this match, incredible. Uh, Chris Bay showing that kind of just smarmy oh the heel you want to see you lose you gotta have somebody like that in every promotion it's him and it's ace austin here for me at least in impact and it's really he's he's got that character he's got that position nailed down tjp hats off to tjp i know that he comes off sometimes in interviews as a bit of a prick considering he said he has never learned anything from any opponent he's been in the ring in with, and he was in the ring with Kota Ibushi. So, <laughs> I mean, that, that just alone, uh, he was in the ring with Brian Kendrick, for, for crying out loud, for the Cruiserweight, uh, cruise, back in the WWE Cruiserweight division. So it's a little weird when he says things like that, but then there's also matches like this, and you're like, wow, this guy's continually continually putting both Rohit Raju and Chris Bay into two different submissions at the same time. And you're just like, wow, like that's just, 
from a flexibility standpoint, I can't do that. Like that's that's incredible. That's that 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 alone is just incredible. Kudos to all three of these guys who worked this match very well. Bay being the uh, chicken shit heel who's trying to take advantage where he can. TJP being a strong face who's fighting for what what he wants. Rohit Raju, who is being the kind of heavyweight of the match and taking the beatings for Chris Bay to allow him to have those moments where he can be the chicken shit heel. Just really well thought out match. Well, really well planned out match. Definitely deserved match of the night. And that's kind of, that's how you want a show to start. Maybe not starting with the match of the night, but you want to start off on a really high note. Like if you think about it, think about, I forget, it was uh, WrestleMania 34 when, 34 or 35? Might have been 35. You know, 34, 34. Uh, in, in New Orleans when they have the, 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 the event start with the triple threat for the Intercontinental Championship when they have Balor versus Miz versus Rollins. That's how you start a show. You start a show off with a big match. Not necessarily a, a, a triple threat, but just a big match. And from this, we now go to Russell House. <laughs> and here on Russell House, we have AC and Larry talking about... I, I mean, at least this part I thought was kind of funny. Uh, AC's asking, why does Larry smell so bad? Now... We know that they're, they are continuing this story with Rosemary using her magic to use Larry to make Bravo jealous. It's kind of a weirdish love triangle thing. And so in order to continue this, Larry's trying to impress Rosemary, not knowing that he's under mind control. Um, I, I was thinking of the uh, Batman Hush comic when 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 soup when soups is under Poison Ivy's mind control and Batman has to beat the shit out of him in order to uh, to Batman beat Superman. Sorry, you'll you'll get over it. Batman's that guy. But anyway, here he's wearing a cologne that he says is actual ring rust, which I thought that part was hilarious. <laughs> Uh, coming out of Wrestle House, we have a Good Brothers promo. It's kind of the same as last week, talking about how they're going to beat the crap out of uh, Ace and Madman Fulton. I kind of just want to see them get to the match. I don't think the promo was necessary. We're, we're already watching, right? Um, after this, there is Moose versus Trey. This was a good match. I thought it was going to be match of the night, again. But, like we said, that earlier triple threat. But this match itself still was very, very good. They told a good David and Goliath story. Trey Miguel could not overcome Moose. I'm not, I wasn't anticipating Moose winning. I mean, I'm sorry, I wasn't anticipating Trey winning. I was anticipating Moose retaining because I know that EC3 is around the corner. But EC3 isn't just around the corner. EC3 is popping up out of nowhere. And he is laying Moose out. But more importantly, he's leaving the ring with the TNA World Heavyweight Championship. Can you be a fake champion if you don't have your fake championship? That's an interesting question. Also, if possession is nine tenths of the law, then does that make EC3 the new fake TNA World Heavyweight Champion? You gotta ask a lawyer about this. I don't know. We gotta talk to somebody, I guess. Anyway, uh, one thing that's kind of interesting is I don't know if you know, if you read the dirt sheets and all that kind of fun stuff, the dirty screens as they are called uh, by Sid and some of our other True Heel members. There's been talk that EC3 is part of the Ring of Honor tapings that are happening that currently Ring of Honor is starting to make a comeback and they're doing tapings and the rumor is that EC3 was at the tapings possibly with that TNA World Heavyweight Championship. So keep your eyes peeled for that when Ring of Honor comes back. Hey, if they, if they, if they move the date and start airing on Tuesdays, so we'll, be, we'll be talking about that too. <laughs> we'll, have a lot, we'll have a lot of uh, material to cover. Um, after this, there is Hernandez in a promo or backstage vignette, I'm sorry, with Reno Scum. And it's talking about he's, he's dipping up the money that he got when Reno Scum beat up Rhino and were able to get him back the money that Rhino took from him. And he says that he has more work for them down the road, so we'll see what happens with that. After this, there is a nice vignette for Eric Young talking about all the things he's done in Impact Wrestling and how right now he is in his purest form. Very dangerous. The madman, the craziness of Eric Young running roughshod over the TNA 
I'm not trying not to see an impact. Too, too, too much talking about Moose and his championship over the Impact locker room. After this, they have a interview with Willie Mack and Jimmy Jacobs that turns into an interview with Brian Myers and Jimmy Jacobs, and then Willie Mack attacks Brian Myers because of Myers interrupting his TV time. I will say that this is all right. It's okay. It's a pretty good segment in the sense that Brian Myers is able to vent his frustration and kind of show who his character, more and more of who his character is going to be. I think that they are going to use this to set up a emergence match next week, which will be confirmed later in the show. Uh, it's good that they're filling out the card. That's one of the things we were talking about last week because we didn't know what was going to happen with night two of emergence, how they were going to fill out the card. This is going to be a good match to have on that card to give both Mac a chance to shine uh, to maybe bounce back from the Eric Young loss, but then also for Brian Myers to shine, maybe a chance for Brian Myers to bounce back after his debut did not go so well for him up against Eddie Edwards. And we still don't know who's going to be challenging Eddie Edwards for the world title. I think it's probably going to be Eric Young, but we'll see what happens there. After this, there is a short little vignette for, very short, for Heath Slater, which was kind of comical. It was probably funnier than the Wrestle House scenes before and then we have a nice tag match between the good brothers ace madman fulton moving the storyline along good brothers pick up that win over ace and madman maybe they're going to be positioned to look out or look after look after look out long to say to go after <laughs> go, go after whoever wins in the main event which is that motor city machine guns versus the north for the tag titles after this, we go back to Wrestle House. The cousin Jake and uh, Cody Diener have lost their beers, or shall we say that somebody permanently borrowed their beers, and there's a problem there because they wanted those beers. So we will <laughs> shortly find out what is going on there, but we get Taya versus Kylie Ray. This match kind of seemed weird to me in the sense that Rosemary is the referee, but she's helping Taya. And they've already been telling us, storyline-wise, that Taya and Rosemary are having some problems. They're, you know, they're, they're besties, but they're having some problems, as, as many friends have throughout, over the years. You can have a wide number of problems. But why she's helping Taya Valkyrie cheat in order to beat Kylie Ray, something about it just seems off. But either way, Kylie Ray picks up the win. Smiley Kylie, she's just happy to be here. and She's just happy to beat the crap out of all of her opponents, Virtuosa or Jordan Grace. You guys are on notice. You should be on the lookout. And after this, we go back to the Impact Zone for our main event, Motor City Machine Guns, putting up the tag titles against the North. Are the North going to be able to reclaim their titles? The answer is no. They are not going to be able to reclaim their titles. Good match. Better than the previous tag match to me. But really good match, solid solid showing between both the teams. The North showing why they are one of the best tag teams in Impact history. Motor City Machine Guns showing why they are one of the best tag teams in Impact history. A nice main event. I like that they showcased the tag team division in this match. They showcased them throughout the course of the night with just... The Good Brothers, Ace and Madman, Fulton, but also even the segments with Diener and Cousin Jake and Triple uh, XL, even Fala Ba being there for to sh support his tag team partner in TJP. This was kind of a nice showing for the tag team division to show what they have and what they can build upon. Reno Scum also backstage with uh, Hernandez before I forget. So I thought it was a good match. The North did not pick up the win. I'm guessing maybe... We'll see something at, at, at Bound for Glory. Maybe the North will have to earn the match against Motor City Machine Guns. Maybe the Good Brothers will also be involved. Who knows? But no matter what happens, remember, guys, we will be there to cover it all with you. I'm looking out for more information on what's going to happen with the NWA coming back with that weekly pay-per-view series via Thunder Studios. Uh, so until then, until next time, uh, I'll catch you guys later. Stay safe, and thanks for watching.